You're listening to Girls with Grafts, a burn community podcast created by Phoenix Society for Burn Survivors, a leading nonprofit dedicated to supporting the burn community. In this podcast, we'll talk with burn survivors, share resources to help with supporting and improving burn recovery, and discuss how to prevent burn injuries. Here are your hosts, burn survivors and Phoenix Society's marketing team, Amber Wilcox and Rachel Kudlak. Hello and welcome to Girls with Graphs. I am Rachel Kudlak and I am joined by my co-host Amber Wilcox. Hi there. So excited we're back for another episode this week. Rachel, you've got a great episode all set up for us and we have an amazing guest. So I'll let you kick it off and get started with, with really what brings us here this week. Yes, I'm so excited. So we have a special episode of Girls with Graphs this week um, because it is National Burn Awareness Week. So National Burn Awareness Week is happening all week long. It started on the 5th and runs through the 11th of February this month. Um, It is hosted by the American Burn Association. It's always the first full week in February. And it's really a great way for organizations to mobilize burn, fire, and life safety Um, to unite in sharing a common burn awareness and prevention messages all week long. I mean, they're important all year long, but especially this week, it's great to come together um, and share, you know, a common theme. So this year's theme is hot liquids burn like fire. So that's all you know, preventing child burns. So we have someone who knows a little bit more about that um, on the podcast today. So I'm excited to introduce our guest, Jane Fair. She was burned in a scald accident on her birthday and the day before her father's funeral in October 2020 in the middle of the COVID pandemic. She is a hidden burn survivor and was connected to Phoenix Society a few months later, and it played a large role in her recovery. She is a Phoenix SOAR peer supporter and frequently moderates our Wednesday evening Facebook peer support chats. Jane has been working in the pharmaceutical industry in a variety of clinical development positions for the last 25 years. She is currently a consultant specializing in contracts for outsource clinical trials. And in her spare time, which it doesn't sound like she probably has a lot of because she's a busy woman, she loves walking, Pilates, reading, and kayaking. So Jane, I'm so happy to have you on the podcast today. I'm happy to be here and um, also particularly happy to be talking um, about um, the importance of being aware of hot liquids in the kitchen or um, elsewhere in the house. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And everything Rachel mentioned about Burnt Awareness Week, we will put all the, the notes and links in our show notes for you to learn more about how you can get involved with Burnt Awareness Week. Uh, but Jane, thanks for joining us. Uh, I, I want to get started and kick off along with being an active and valued member of our community. We asked you to join the podcast this week because you are uh, a scald burn survivor, uh, similar to myself. So um, I'd love it if you don't mind sharing a little bit more about your injury and your journey as a burn survivor. So um, my this uh, it started like any other day. Um, uh, I uh, because I am such an active person, I uh, put on uh, yoga pants um, and. Uh, little half socks um, and went down to the kitchen to make my coffee. Um, At that time, I was making uh, coffee using an electric kettle and instant coffee. And electric kettles uh, boil like really hot. Um, And um, I was distracted thinking about how I was going to get, who was going to drive me to my father's funeral. I wasn't paying attention and I tipped the kettle over. Um, It was full of boiling water. It went down my um, right leg. And um, at first I didn't think much of it, uh, but then it started to hurt and I could not get uh, my yoga pants off because they were wet on top of, so it's like trying to get off a wetsuit. 
Um, and uh, because of my um, involvement in the pharmaceutical industry, somehow I knew that I had to get get the clothes off and get in the shower under cool water, which I somehow managed to do. Uh, and I'm not going to go into details, uh, but um, when I looked at my leg and what was happening and the giant blisters that were forming um, and pieces of skin uh, that were becoming loose, um, I just realized I had to call 911. Mm -hmm. uh, I live alone. Um, and uh, thankfully, 911 came uh, very, very, they were here within, honest to God, two, three minutes, probably because it was COVID and they didn't have their usual early morning traffic accident calls to deal with. Um, so this was like seven o'clock in the morning, seven, seven thirty. Um, and um, I don't remember much uh, about that part of it, um, except that um, they cut my clothes off. Uh, and um, this part I was very impressed with. They actually had um, a burn uh, specialist on a, an iPad. Oh, wow. I don't think I knew that either. Um, and, uh, you know, they were deciding whether I needed to be airlifted or whether I could go on in the ambulance. Uh, and the decision was uh, that I probably should be airlifted just because of the distance. Um, but there was no helicopter available. Mm -hmm. So I went in an ambulance. Um, and the ambulance ride, I don't really remember much because they um uh ambulance drivers uh have a choice they can give you um they have a choice of two uh drugs that they can give you uh they decided to give me um ketamine which is also um, known as the date rape drug um and I had a very bad reaction, uh, so I basically hallucinated, and I don't remember much of the rest of the day, which is probably not such a bad thing. Um, and, um, you know, um, I had to drive uh, through the streets of DC with potholes and speed bumps, and yep. And it was COVID, uh, so mm -hmm. arriving at the hospital, they took me through a special entrance in the back so I didn't have to go through the emergency room, which was full of people. Just, we had no vaccines at that time. Um, so it was um, an er unearthly experience. Um, and I never knew, I had no idea that, um, hot water could do something like that. I'd never had an experience with hot water. And if I did, it was probably like a very minor thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'd also like to point out, um, I know I'm jumping around a little bit here, uh, that um, it's not just uh, boiling water in the kitchen. Um, mm -hmm. that you can, um, some older hot water heaters don't have, um, the correct temperature controls there where you can set how hot the water gets so even adults these days can burn themselves quite severely um taking a shower or a bath i was gonna and say also I, children um yeah i know people that have had right their hot water is too hot and mm -hmm. stick their foot in a bathtub and not realize it and, and give themselves a burn but yeah children yes. as well right uh, mm -hmm. So, um, yes, so um, any kind of hot liquid, um, you know, the worst I'd ever had happen was, you know, uh, you know, trying to get something out of the toaster in a tiny little thing on my finger. Uh, never had anything of this magnitude. Mm -hmm. Yeah, scalds can happen in any way in any hot liquid. So in my case, I had hot caramel, which of course, um, stuck, but Again, any kind of hot liquid touching touching you or any kind of 
um, burn that wasn't by fire um, in this instance. So Jane's, you know, hot water is an example of um, a scald burn. Mm -hmm. Yep. And yes. children too, along with older, like senior citizens, they, since their skin is thinner and not as developed or it's thinning at the older age, they're at a higher risk too of, you know, uh, something may feel warm to us, but maybe to a child, it's way too hot or that burning temperature just due to the skin's thickness. Yep. And, uh, you know, people are, um, every time I see somebody uh, cooking pasta, mm. we carry a great big pot of hot water. water to wherever the sink is. That is... Mm -hmm. And children in the kitchen pulling things over on themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, too, with that, like, there's safety measures that we can put in place for children. I know after my injury, I had so many folks reach out and say, now I have a gate, right? And we have a gate in our kitchen. So whether it's a dog or an, an animal uh, or a child, right, having a gate barricading them. Because if you were to accidentally bring that hot water over to the sink, right, and accidentally spill it, um, that could could be a hazard as well. So I think that's really important. I think I've seen like um, temperature readers on, on any like bathtubs, right? Or so if you're worried about how your hot water regulates, there's those little, they sell little thermometers that you can even, I've seen them little like ducks even mm -hmm. that you could stick in the water and read what the temperature is. So if you're worried if your bathtub is too hot, whether it's for a child or yourself, it's really important to um, be able to read that temperature for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And on hot water heaters, you can set the maximum uh, temperature, which when I first bought my house, I was like, why doesn't the water in this house get really, really hot? Mm. Um, and I didn't do anything about it because the building inspector uh, told me uh, why, um, because it's newer construction. Um, and so newer construction does have a lot of these safety features. But also in the kitchen, having um, small pets underfoot while you're mm -hmm. cooking. Uh, tripping hazards. Yeah. Tripping hazards. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, these things are accidents. Um, and they happen so fast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, I'm um, grateful to be um, a survivor. Yes. Yes. And I mean, that's, you kind of hit on, you know, why Burn Awareness Week is so important because accidents are always going to happen. There's, there's not going to be a day where no accidents are ever happening, but there are a lot of preventable steps, prevention tips that you can follow to try and prevent these accidents from occurring. Um, I was looking up some stats earlier to sh share on our social media and about half of all house fires are actually caused by cooking, which is insane. And there was actually during COVID an increase of house fires since people were at home and they were cooking more and they weren't able to go out. So I know you guys were kind of sharing some um, kitchen tips earlier, but I wanted to ask if either both of you or either of you um, have any like kitchen safety tips that maybe you learned um, throughout your injury that you want to share with us. I think I agree with that stat, Jane, and I'm sure, you know, um, I've heard it myself as well. But I think with when we talk about um, COVID, right, we bring up COVID here for a moment. Um, I know I was that day making a, I think a, a pie of some sort with that hot caramel and remembering like we were stuck in the house. I was watching like whatever spring baking championship mm -hmm. on the Food Network thinking like I want to be, you know, keeping my mind busy and doing something. So I was just kind of same thing, like mindlessly not really paying attention too much attention, but reading the instructions and kind of going about my day. But um, I think had it not been COVID, I may not have been just sitting in the kitchen, right? Like making food. Um, so I truly believe that stat because I, I know of that. But yes, one of the things that I've learned, I think in general is to not um, hot liquid and glass um, don't mix well. Um, and that's something that, you know, we shared on, on our social media channels after my accident, because while we realize it happens, I don't think we always realize to what temperature or to what degree, um, especially if a glass is cold or cooler and you put a warm liquid in it, it can explode. Or in general, if the liquid is too hot and you put it in the glass, 
Um, so since then, my husband and I just refuse to put any hot warm liquid in any glass. Um, obviously mugs are different, right? Hot coffee and mugs, but we tend to uh, spend, like if we're making something in the kitchen that we think is too warm, put it in a different um, container specifically because we're worried about that glass exploding. Um, and in my case, the glass exploded, but the shards actually also hit my skin. So I did have some little cuts as a result as well. So there's that secondary concern of if you have glass that explodes, um, you have those little shards. And of course, at the time we did have dogs. So, or we still have dogs, but we had two dogs and you know, that hot caramel exploded all over my legs and the floor. Well, the dogs of course were very much attracted to the sugary caramel. Um, but with mm. their shards of glass all over the floor, my husband actually found one of my dogs like picking up a shard of glass during that. So there was that secondary concern of, um, when your glass, you know, when a glass breaks, you have to worry about all of those other elements as well. And Jane, I'll turn it over to you there. <laughs> so actually people don't even think about putting a glass in a microwave. Um, that is, uh, that's that gla glass can get very overheated, um, with liquid in the microwave. And sometimes it's not until you reach in and touch it that mm -hmm. something uh, happens. Mm -hmm. So I uh, no longer have an electric kettle uh, because, and I cook on back burners on the stove, <laughs> uh, but the kettle that was, uh, went in the trash uh, very quickly. I don't have a need for an electric kettle. And I was actually, um, I actually don't even uh, make hot coffee. I now make my own cold brew coffee. Love that. I, I need another cup of coffee right now. I should have made one before we started <laughs> recording today. <laughs> and I think before, you know, before we were injured and Jane, I don't know if you can relate to this, like there were, there wasn't that heightened awareness of everything around us, but I think also getting to meet other survivors like Jane in, in Phoenix Society support groups and whatnot, you learn other stories of things that have happened to other folks. Um, and one of the things actually we even learned in the burn unit at Orlando Health um, were the number they shared with us, the sheer number of injuries that they also had from like Instapots, right? The steam of an Instapot and not being careful and backing away. Um, so my husband and I were very hesitant to get an Instapot, but wanted to make sure that we reviewed the safety ratings of whatever Instapot or pressure cooker we purchased because of the injuries that they had mentioned. There was such a high number Orlando, Orlando Health had shared of Instapot injuries where um, the steam that, you know, if you've ever used an Instapot, use the steam that explodes from it. Um, the steam could really cause a serious burn injury as well. So that's the other thing we're really careful about is making sure it has an extra lock and we don't open it until we know all the steam has been, you know, um or has has been released from the machine so there's another one for you yeah and even with like microwavable meals that you put in and they have those covers on them like that plastic film when you pull that back you know there's oh. so much heat and steam built into that little plastic container so even you know if you don't have an in-spot or there's so many the kitchen in general there's so many hazards so it's really important you know or burn awareness week and all year long to really educate yourself and others. Um, Cause like you said, unfortunately, many people don't realize some of these things until they know someone or they've had an injury themselves. So uh, kitchens and bathrooms, I think are the big place. I'm sure there are other places where there's hot water, um, but um, in the home, uh, I mean, in industrial settings or work settings, uh, but in the home, uh, bathrooms and kitchens mm -hmm. are very, very important. Mm -hmm. And if you have um, older construction, I think it's well worth having um, a plumber come in and see what can be done to install some safety mm -hmm. precautions. Yeah, absolutely. Or just taking them yourself, right? I know as a result of our injury, Tyler and I, or my injury, Tyler and I kind of just, okay, we're going to not, you know, not use this anymore. We're going to make sure we get off the kitchen so the dogs can't be around us. So those are things that I think, you know, obviously raising awareness of, of um, others and making sure you take the safety me measures in your house, but also I think making sure that if there's something quick that you can do to eliminate 
a risk that's important. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, I know we've kind of been talking all about, you know, kitchen and bathroom injuries and burns, but Jane, I do want to kind of go back to your story for a little and your journey as a survivor. And um, can you tell us a little bit about how you first learned about Phoenix Society? Because were you still in the hospital when you first learned about us? Is that correct? So I um, uh, saw um, a poster on a wall uh, for uh, the Phoenix Society magazine. Um, and I took a picture that that's how I was uh, connected. I actually took a picture. Um, and um, uh, went to I went to sign up for the magazine. That's what I thought I was uh, doing. Um, and um, they had uh, stressed to me uh, from the, the very beginning, uh, the importance of having um, psychological uh, support. Um, so I did have a therapist uh, because my father had been dying. Um, so I already had was hooked up with a mental health professional who also happened to be trauma aware, fortunately. Um, so, um, uh, but I still felt, uh, so alone, um, because COVID and I hadn't met any, so I thought a magazine might be nice. Um, and no, none of my friends, uh, I mean, it was in the middle of COVID. So granted, and people were having their own issues, you know, being cooped up in house with four young children, you know, various, uh, issues. Um, and um, nobody really um, had the time or the inclination or even the uh, skills to listen to me. Um, so um, I thought, I'll, maybe this magazine will be good. And when I went on the website, I saw that there was um, a Zoom support call every second and fourth Thursday. Monday, close. I was never a person for support groups, but I showed up and um, I will tell, I mean, um, everybody that was there uh, saw it, but I'm not ashamed to say it. I introduced myself and I cried the entire time because I was just, it wasn't tears of sadness it was tears that there were finally people that understood what was happening to me and uh my, my impatience, impatience with uh, and wanting to know how long it was going to take for uh the burns to uh heal uh, so my biggest uh, issue is uh, they wanted me to walk because the mo one of the most severe parts of my burn was on my foot and ankle. So they made me walk from day one, uh, which was, un I don't even know how to describe uh, that. Uh, the words I use, um, it felt like somebody was jackhammering um, the bottom of my foot it would go straight up my leg um so um and um yep so i cried uh and i was just so grateful and i've been um the value there there every every, every yeah <laughs> yeah uh so um and everybody that was on the call uh just said we're so glad you found us it's okay to cry I had my box of tissues and I just sat there crying the whole time. Um, and, um, you know, now when um, new people find us and they uh, come and they start to cry, I uh, jump in and I say, it's okay to cry. I cried the whole 90 minutes. <laughs> That's a long time to cry. <laughs> But that was how much I think you just recognized that you had needed support and you were just so relieved during that time to hear something. Um, and we hear that, right? That happens a lot in support group. Um, Jane and I are both um, avid support group goers and, you know, we see it happen quite often. I know I cried 
during my first time of being like, oh my gosh, there's finally some answers to the, you know, the silly questions that I have and whatnot too. So I think some of it's relief. Yeah. Yeah. So you were burned uh, during COVID as well, right? Amber? I was, yeah, yeah I, I was burned during COVID and it can feel really isolating. Like you said, I know um, during my hospital stay, um, thankfully my husband was able to come into the hospital um, during the day, but couldn't spend the night. Um, which was different from what they had normally had. But my husband also at the time worked at another hospital where they were completely shutting down visitation. And so, and I know that there are other survivors out there that didn't have the luxury of having a guest. Um, yeah. And so I think the first thing I, I remember, you know, my husband also put me in the shower after my injury and I remember standing in the shower and even though I was in excruciating pain, the only thing I cared about was being alone <laughs> Um, and not having my husband there. And thankfully he was able to be there. But at the time of my accident, it happened at about nine o'clock at night, which was when visiting hours were over. And I was about an hour and a half away uh, from, <laughs> from where I was going to be staying in the burn center. I mean, I remember my husband came all the way out there just in time for visiting hours to close. So my husband was able to like rush into the trauma, you know, trauma ICU, grab my hand and squeeze it and be able to say like, I will be here first thing in the morning, but then they rushed me out and that was it. So that can be really, um, really isolating, uh, when you're, you know, in a, a new place with, um, all of these injuries that you're experiencing and feel like you're completely alone. Uh, so being in the hospital during that time was scary, I think for a lot of us. Yes. Um, Indeed. Indeed. National Burn Awareness Week is all about educating and advocating for burn awareness. Um, and you are a big advocate for our community. Uh, but why is it so important to you that you share your story with others, um, especially on National Burn Awareness Week? Well, there are any number of reasons. Number one is um, to um, uh, raise awareness of the importance of prevention. Um, to raise awareness that there are uh, support groups um, out there. Um, Phoenix Society is uh, uh, one of the larger, well, most more well-known one, uh, ones, uh, but there are other support groups. Um, as a result of COVID, um, in-person support groups are still very, very, very spotty, mm -hmm. uh, which surprises me. Um, to be quite honest, but hospitals, they're usually um, affiliated with um, hospitals. So hospitals, I guess, don't still don't wanna bring large numbers of people that don't need medical treatment um, into their facilities. Um, they don't have to. Um, yeah, we, uh, it's true. We have seen, you know, kind of speaking on that support group, um, you know, hospitals are finally starting to kind of reopen some of them, but a lot of them are still either held virtually or not held at all. Um, unfortunately, there's so many, you know, different factors going into that, but yeah, the virtual options are a great way to get started. And even if it's like, you, Jane's just showing up and introducing and you can sit there and cry. You can just listen to stories. It's just so important, you know, taking that first step and joining. Um, and it's interesting too, as you guys both speak about COVID, it's like twofold because one, you're get, being isolated in the hospital with no visitors and for any injury or any illness, you're getting that isolation. And then on top of it, burns are a very isolating injury themselves because, like we said, you don't really know many survivors until you are a survivor. So, you know, what maybe, you know, now I know the pandemic is over or coming to an end. We're kind of resuming normal. But what advice would the both of you give to survivors who are feeling so isolated, whether they're at home or still in the hospital? Uh, I would say uh, reach out to the virtual support groups, even while you're in the hospital. Um, and um, the earlier you can tell your story, 
telling your story. I was very reluctant, um, even reluctant to do this podcast um, two plus years out. Um, telling, because I'm a very private uh, person, uh, but telling your story not only helps others, but it really helps you as well mm -hmm. to uh, come to terms uh, with your injury um, and your recovery. Um, so it's uh, the injury itself is traumatic. Recovery is traumatic, uh, but the re and the recovery process um, even, it continues long after the burns themselves have healed, whether or not you've had grafts or not. Um, there's follow-up surgeries. Um, there's, uh, and the emotional uh, recovery continues for a long time and mm -hmm. the phys and you know the uh surgical the medical interventions can continue for the rest of your life mm -hmm. uh scars are dynamic growing things uh yes, yes. uh so um i was um lucky enough to have um laser surgeries that started uh probably i think my first one was a few weeks after i found the phoenix society um in uh february because they were uh concerned about the mobility in my ankle and lasers do help uh with the scar the scarring so i had uh six uh laser surgeries in a year um and the worst part about them is uh the anesthesia uh, so now I really have um, an aversion to anesthesia. Prior, before the, the burns, I had maybe had anesthesia two times in my life. Um, six times in a year is just a lot. Uh, mm. So um, I, I think I've had it. And I've also um, developed... Um, uh, I don't like uh, strong pain medication uh, much anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, neither of those things are such bad things, not to like anesthesia or not <laughs> to like, uh, but you know, um, yes. Uh, so uh, telling your, st so that's why it's important to tell my, to tell your story. Um, and that's why I'm here. Yeah, and I will probably not listen to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and I think when it comes to advice, Jane, like I know we both found Phoenix Society very early on, right? And being able to join virtual support group, virtual support group um, was my only option at the time, right? There, the in persons weren't available, um, and my burn center had since started up some quarterly support, but I wanted more than that. I wanted something more regularly. Um, and so knowing that I could rely on that uh, Phoenix Society support group to this day, right, if I'm um, having a bad week and just need a group of folks to, to lean on, whether it's related to my burns or um, related to something else, but my burns may have that mm -hmm. after kind of a factor is what brings us together. Um, I think that's so important. Um, I've also found myself several burn buddies, Jane being one of them. So um, Jane and I were going through the similar experiences at the same time. So I think uh, Jane and I both were having lasers almost simultaneously sharing pictures of our lasers and whatnot. So um, I don't think everyone watching this would know, but Jane and I are very close because I think because our injuries were so similar in nature, but also um, because we were burn buddies, right? We had, had kind of joined support around the same time and been able to so when you have someone that can relate to what you're going through, mm -hmm. I think it makes that connection even stronger of being able to just have someone that understands when you're having a bad day, it's not necessarily always related to your injury, but be able to know that. Um, so that would be my advice is find your people. Cause I think we, Jane and I know that there's a group of people that join that weekly or the biweekly virtual support group uh, with the Phoenix society. And whether or not we always feel like going, I try to try to make sure I still go because I always feel uh, refreshed after after that, you know, uh, after that day of being able to know I can connect with people I really, truly care about. 
And um, speaking of support groups, um, if you're having a bad day, um, many times you don't want to be around other people and you don't want to join, that's when you do need to join. Jane, I'd love for you to talk for a moment because I know um, you've also been so helpful in, in our Wednesday evening virtual support chat. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that for those that are, are listening um, and why you think that's important compared to, you know, the on video chat, perhaps? So uh, the uh, Wednesday uh, video, uh, when did those start, um, Amber? Um, I think we started before Five COVID, ago? correct, Rachel? Yeah, we've had the peer support chat in a few different variations um, for a very long time. And Okay, well, in its current uh, variation, um, well, actually, there's, I've been around for two variations, so we had to change it because there were so many people wanting to join. <laughs> so uh, there are people who are just uh, not comfortable being on camera, like me. <laughs> um uh but um and uh and um it can be intimidating to be on camera um and to tell your story um so the uh so it's a facebook uh messenger uh chat um so you can pop in and out um as you uh have time um you uh one of the other things is that you can scroll back like uh, if, like I, I'm terrible with names and associating names with stories. If there's a whole bunch of new people, you can always scroll back in the chat and say, ah, okay, that's, they were burned uh, five years ago. And um, yes, um, and uh, there are people that have uh, young children or other things going on. Um, I think it's just a, a different uh, format. And I think younger generations, um, but we have um, all ages that join, um, uh, but younger generations are just more uh, comfortable in uh, the uh, digital online, like the, the chat type uh, thing, as opposed to speaking on the telephone or via Zoom. And that's in our online community. So uh, Phoenix <laughs> Society also recently opened up our, uh, an online group. So we have folks that are chatting in our online group 24-7, but on Wednesday night, similar to the Monday meetings, everyone kind of meets in that chat thread and has conversations. Usually we try to keep them topic focused. Um, Jane is, is constantly moderating them, so you'll see her pop in and out. But Topics can range uh, for a variety of things, and we don't always just talk about the topic. There are other times where we have new survivors joining that have questions, um, and we're always open to, to answer them. Um, I typically am there with, with Jane or our friend Pam, who works here at Phoenix Society, and uh, there are a lot of other moderators that you may see in the community. So that is a specifically peer support SOAR um, so we're moderated chat. So unlike, you know, any other chat, we make sure that those that have been trained in supporting others are also there to be a part of that conversation as well. Uh, so Jane, I want to switch gears a little bit here. And I know you mentioned this to us at the beginning and um, we're both hidden burn survivors as well, which I think makes our injuries also um, unique, but you, you brought up a really great topic of that feeling of imposter syndrome sometimes. Um, so I'd love it if you could talk for a little bit about what it's like to be a hidden burn survivor. Um, and, and we can go from there. Yes. So, um, uh, even when I first joined, uh, so, um, my burn is on my right leg, so I can wear long pants. And um, I have very fair skin, um, so I tend to wear long pants even in the summer, uh, just for sun protection. Uh, so um, people that might meet me uh, might not have any idea that I have that I am a burn survivor, and, and I can tell you that people do not. Um, and um, but. Um, we have uh, under, you know, the, the, the burn, we were burned, significantly burned. Um, uh, the healing process is the same. Um, and um, 
the emotional uh, healing is the same. Um, it's just that uh, we have the option to hide our burns. Um, and um, when I first heard somebody say, I, I, I felt that way, um, but I never heard anybody really use the word imposter. Like, uh, like there are people, if you have a facial burn, that it's not very easy to cover your burn and you have to deal with a lot of inquisitive people um, mm -hmm. and staring, et cetera, which we don't have to deal with, but we still have scars that we see and our loved ones see. Um, and um, I, because I'm still, uh, I was told to stay out of the sun for two years, so I haven't gone outside in a bathing suit or shorts yet. The, this summer will be the first time I do that. Uh, so it will be my first time in public, um, so to speak, um, as a non-hidden. Uh, but um, we, uh, so people that can hide their scars, we're, uh, there are different, there, you know, we, we have the option to cover them, uh, but we still share so much with mm -hmm. uh, other people mm -hmm. who have been burned, who don't have the, the option to cover their scars. Definitely. And like you mentioned, you know, so I have scars on my face and my hands, so I definitely can't hide them, or at least not very well. Um, so yeah, like you mentioned, I may have to deal with staring or questions when I go out in public, but then on the flip side, when you are going out in your bathing suit this summer, that's going to be a new experience for you because you are showing them off. So, I mean, there's definitely things you know we can learn from one another and help each other. And yeah, hidden burn survivors, we have a lot of them in our community and, you know, you are a part of our community and like, it doesn't matter if you can see them or not. Um, you're, you're I wasn't even aware that there was such a term as mm -hmm. hidden burn survivor, but you learn the lingo um, and people <laughs> introduce themselves as hidden burn survivors because um, of just that, um, that we, we are, uh, we do have scars, physical and emotional. You just can't see them all and the I time. I think that sometimes makes it harder, right? And you know, um, like going back to work, right? So I've worked remote for a very long time. And right after my accident, you know, you couldn't see what was basically below my neckline, really, right? Of So my burns are all below the waist. And uh, that can be really difficult for others to understand, like, oh, you appear to be fine. Um, and so it can give that appearance, right? But then um, maybe I'm really struggling, even though you can't see my burns. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe there's, you know, things that you just don't know about because you can't see them. Um, and so that can be a challenge I know that I had of just because you can't see them doesn't mean that I'm not dealing with something um, regardless. So I think that's a difficult thing as a hidden burn survivor to, to point out of it can be really hard to overcome or even just be able to share like, hey, I'm also dealing with something that you may not be able to see. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, when I first went, thank you for bringing that up, um, Amber. When I first went back to work, um, uh, people assumed that I had been out for three months because my father died. Um, and um, it was probably, I probably went back to work too soon um, uh, from, the, um, from an emotional perspective. Um, and it was very, very difficult um, because exactly what Amber said, people could not see that there was anything wrong. Uh, people that knew me really well could tell that there was something wrong because mm -hmm. of my facial expression um, and the fact that I went off camera a lot because I would cry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, or just need to compose myself because people can say, can say, um, the, the, the strangest and most hurtful things, mm -hmm. um, 
um, in uh, even in professional meetings. Uh, so socially, it's really hard as well. So I still uh, sh struggle with um, watching TV uh, because on TV, people can be on fire uh, for like two minutes on TV. And the EMTs say, oh, they're going to be fine. Mm -hmm. That is not uh, true. So the first movie I really watched was um, Home Alone. So I was burned in October and um, I, uh, yeah, so I was um, not in my home. I, I spent a lot of time at home um, mm -hmm. during COVID, but I, the day before Christmas, so we were watching Home Alone and uh, I can't, I'm very bad with the names of actors, but mm -hmm. um, his, his oh, hair catches on yeah. fire, <laughs> yeah. you know. The house catches like all this stuff happens and he's absolutely fine it's like the road runner if you remember those old old cartoons um and i really um uh, i know that's not the topic of today but uh the way that um burns are depicted in mm -hmm. entertainment venues really does need to change um mm -hmm. and uh because that adds like um, and uh, that, you know, you can catch on fire and you're going to be fine. No, you're not going to be fine. Mm -hmm. yeah. Eventually, I'm not saying you're going to, but right. it, it's not like, I have never heard anybody, did anybody tell you you're going to be like, if you were burned that, oh, you're going to be fine tomorrow. You'll be home next week. No, they can't tell you that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, and I know this kind of leads me into my next question. Um, I've heard you're famously known for sharing your wisdom about needing patience in recovery, which we don't we don't see a lot of on the TV. Um, so can you just share a little bit more about what that means and um, what advice you have for survivors in their recovery and that patience? So um, when, uh, um, yes, when I first joined the, uh, the Zoom uh, sessions, I wanted to know when am I going to be healed physically? When am I going to be healed emotionally? I asked, but before I even found the Phoenix Society, I asked my doctors and <laughs> all the people on the team constantly, when, 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 and the answer was everybody's different. <laughs> and that made me, I, it made me crazy. Um, and I thought by joining the Phoenix Society, ah, I'm going to get answers to the when, 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 when. Um, and guess what? I got the same answer. <laughs> so now it's kind of a joke. Uh, but um, the newcomers that's the first uh thing um both in the zoom session and in the chat in the chat it's more uh it's more obvious because you can have multiple conversations but every week the same people ask when am i going to be when are these when is this when is it going to stop itching when is the nerve pain going to stop? When, when, when? And the answer is everybody is different. Um, we can share um, how, how how long it took for us. Uh, so for me, my, my lingering issue is nerve pain. And um, the best my doctors can tell me is it may never go away. I mean, it's not excruciating, uh, but it is, it's my right foot. So it is very, very annoying mm. uh, to drive um, and to uh, sometimes uh, I can't stand uh, for long periods of time. I have to move um, because otherwise it feels like my foot is falling asleep. You know, mm. if you cut off circulation to your mm -hmm. foot, that, that awful feeling and medication helps but it doesn't there is no nothing that makes it completely go away so mm -hmm. it has gotten less with time uh but it's still there so i'm currently uh sitting here um moving my 
foot under the table because um, I am a remote worker. Um, and so that's, um, I wonder what it would be like if I, I guess I would have to just tell people that I need to stand up if I were in a real face-to-face -face work setting, mm -hmm. which I haven't been um, since my burn. So Jane, uh, I know we're wrapping up on time here, but we have a couple of last minute questions for you. I guess as we begin to close out here, I'd love to know what advice you'd give survivors or loved ones who maybe are hesitant. I know we've seen this before and I think you've told it, touched on this a little bit, but um, were you hesitant at that time and what really um, kept you from, or kept you coming back to peer support? Um, and now even has, has made you become a peer supporter. Um, what keeps you from coming or what keeps you coming back? Well, as I said, I was, I'm a very private uh, person, so it was very, very hard for me to do that. Uh, but um, telling my story um, and being able to just interact and chat with people who have experienced what I have experienced, perhaps to a different degree in a different, but a different setting, a different time point, because there are childhood burn survivors, there's all different types of survivors. Um, that experience has been so helpful. Uh, it's been healing, to be quite honest. Um, and um, I actually wanted to become a peer supporter immediately. Uh, but uh, the Phoenix Society um, doesn't knows that you need to be at a certain point in your recovery before you can uh, do that. But so as soon as I was to that point, um, I signed up uh, because um, quite honestly, I don't think anybody should go through um, recovering from a burn without um, as Amber called it, uh, I uh, also use the term burn buddy, uh, <laughs> burn buddy, peer survivor, somebody else that's experienced what you are experiencing mm -hmm. because it is uh, traumatic um, and COVID or non-COVID, it can feel very isolating because you just, there are so, there, there aren't burn survivors. I'd never met a burn survivor in my entire life. Mm -hmm. until I became one. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that's a long time. <laughs> Definitely. Like I mentioned earlier, you don't really know about our community until you are a part of our community. And, um, you know, we're so happy that, you know, you love being a peer supporter and we're excited to join the Phoenix Sork um, family. So um, Two more quick questions to wrap us up because we always ask these to to our uh, burn survivor guests. But do you do anything special to celebrate your burn anniversary? And if you don't, that's okay too. But we always love to ask. So uh, my first burn anniversary, um, uh, because it's also on my birthday, um, I decided that I was going to change the day of my uh, burn anniversary to the day before my birthday. Um, so I just commemorated. I didn't really do anything on that uh, burn anniversary. Um, I just got through the day, acknowledged that it had been a year. Uh, I probably was uh, uh, tried to be grateful that I was where I was in my recovery. And then the next day I did my um, birthday uh, celebration. Uh, but last year um, I did them both. I did them both. I did my burn anniversary on the real day. Um, and it, it, because being a burn survivor is now um, a part of who I am. And um, it just happens that I was burned on my birthday. So mm -hmm. I still celebrate my birthday um, with an extra uh, people um, say, you know, um, we made another trip around the sun. Well, I made my second trip around the sun as a burn survivor. And I'm not going to say how old I am, but um, uh, many, many more times around the sun. <laughs> uh, 
but um so uh, year two was not i was very apprehensive uh year one uh year two um i have learned uh, the importance of uh, being grateful and mm -hmm. gratitude. And that actually was my New Year's resolution this year is to every day find something to be grateful for. I love that. Mm -hmm. I know uh, we've talked about that already, Jane, but uh, like writing it down in a journal, right, can be really healing even so that you can go back. Um, that's something that I had been taught as well as to write one thing every day you're grateful for. And when you go back, it's actually really cool to read all of the things that you've been grateful for. So I love that. Well, Jane, uh, one more question for you as we wrap up. We always ask our guests, uh, what does self-care look like for Jane? So uh, Jane, do you want to share with those listening today how you practice mm -hmm. self-care? So uh, self-care for me is... Um, turning off um, all external things like the phone, uh, um, et cetera, um, and um, doing, uh, practicing mindfulness. Um, I try to do it uh, at least one, uh, once a day. It doesn't always work, uh, but a few times a week. Um, and I'm also, uh, much i also am much more uh focused on doing some doing things just for me not for other people not because other people want to do it like if i want to go have my nails done um every week i'm going to go do that uh so yes i get my nails done um uh exercise is something that is uh, very important uh, for me. So it took me um, a while to be able to get back into doing uh, Pilates. Uh, but um, that is, uh, that is part of self care, no matter what is going on, I have my book sessions every week, two or three every week. Um, and I go no matter what, uh, so I view that as part of uh, self-care. Um, you know, our bodies are containers uh, for while we're here on this earth and we have to take care of them. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my version of self-care. Love it. I agree. I love doing some mindfulness and exercise. So I share those self-care activities with you. But um, I just want to thank you again, Jane, so much for joining us for a special uh, Burn, National Burn Awareness Week episode of Girls with Graphs. Um, it is happening all week long, Burn Awareness Week, but it truly happens all year long. So it doesn't matter if you're listening to this podcast during that week or not. Um, so for more information on National Burn Awareness Week, be sure to follow Phoenix Society on social media, and you can visit ameriburn.org to learn how you can spread the word and get involved. So thank you again so much, Jane. Um, thank you for having me. Well, it's been a pleasure, Jane. We'll talk to you real soon. Thanks, everyone. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of Girls with Crafts. If you are enjoying this content, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. This helps others find the show, and we greatly appreciate it. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you in the next episode.